Okay, so uh, I was mentioning, um, what was I mentioning? The, the midterm. So uh, the midterm is going to be everything up to and including week five. Um, you have already done the demo test thing. You know how it works. So when you're going to come to class, it's going to be an hour and 30 minutes, not more. Remember that. So, and I start exactly at the beginning of the class. So I have time to go because another class of mine has midterm and it's five minutes from here. So I have to finish exactly at one hour and 30 minutes. And I'll try to make the test short so it uh, goes to that thing. Um, uh, the same rules that we have done applies, which means when you come in immediately, uh, log into your computers and try to be early, come five minutes early, log into your computers at uh, the computers in the lab. You cannot do it from your uh, 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 laptops. Um, open up my apps, open up Notepad++, uh, and then you can start doing the test. Okay, so remember, it's the same thing. You have the Notepad++ at right, you have to test at, at left, you put stuff over there, it has to be formatted. So the two main rules of submitting the code exist. Number one, the code must be indented and properly handed in. Number two, it must relate to the answer to the question that I ask. So if I create, ask you to create a functor that does this, you create a perfect lambda expression that does the same, you get zero. Okay? It must be exactly answer to the question that I have. It must be relevant to it. That prevents copying from reference sheet. You're allowed to have a reference sheet. You must have a reference sheet, even if you don't want anything in it. Okay? So you must bring an A4 size paper double-sided, printed, handwritten, I don't care. You can put the entire thing with size 4 on it, and uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, statistic, and my experience suggests that anybody who writes the reference sheet never uses it, okay? Um, so, and if you get, ref if somebody wants your reference sheet, tell them that it's really a stupid idea. Uh, getting someone else's reference sheet won't help because you have 45 seconds to answer each concept question and uh, just to go through it and see what it is. It's a concept question. I'm asking you what is a lambda expression. It has four answers. You select one. You don't need more than 45 seconds for that. Concept questions, not typing. Concept questions, fill in the blanks and things like that. You're writing one word. So if you don't know what it is, looking for it won't help because you lost the time. Uh, the, I haven't decided to separate the two tests, concept and uh, um, concept and uh, programming. So concept and walkthrough and programming. I don't know. I have to see the logistics for it to see how it works. Uh, it's possible that your concept will be separate. So you're going to do the, a concept test. You finish it. You submit it. You open up your programming test. So the timing will be uh, separate for them. Because I really want you to have to, yes. Yeah, you can, but it's not going to help. Again, sure. But uh, again, uh, well, I, if it's two different ones, it's possible that I would say no reference sheet for concept. But the details of the rules, depending on how I design the test, is going to come up. If they're all together, I cannot tell you not to use it for one because they're all the same, right? Uh, the, the, the questions and everything, again, everything that I'm telling you right now will come up as a post in MS Teams in detail exactly how everything is going to be. But again, I'm mentioning it. Uh, you're going to have the concept questions and the walkthroughs are going to be exactly as how you have done it in your quizzes. Exactly the same. Okay? Um, a, a walkthrough is a small thing with a small thing, to, with a small output. I uh, just want to see if you can follow the output properly and, and you give that. Uh, it, it produces two letters, something like that. So that's the, how the walkthrough is going to be. Um, uh, the questions uh, that you program are going to be two different types. I'll try to make it this way. One is that I give you a piece of code, and I ask you to add a feature to it. Okay? And you might all get the same piece of code. One of you is going to uh, do move assignment. The other one's going to do move constructor. Another one's going to, so things like that. So, it's, so I'm going to have, have you to create different pieces of the code for it. Um, that's, uh, that's one way. Another way is to ask you to write a complete thing. So I might ask you to write a complete code for a template module, which means you are only creating one file. 
because you know templates only have one module. They only have a header file. In that one, and I ask you everything, so that one thing tests to see if you write everything properly, safeguards, uh, file inclusions, and things like that. It's a very small code that I ask you to write complete, and um, you have to assume that it is supposed to be compiled. Of course, if you forgot the I for include, or don't put the semicolon here or there, or misspell something, you're not going to lose mark. I'm looking for logic. I'm not looking for, looking for exact answer. Your, your exact answer comes to you in your project and your, in your workshops, not in the test. OK? Yes? No, because it's very small. It only works on one point of, I'm testing only one small concept. If it was a big walkthrough, yes, I would do that. But it's going to be six small walkthroughs, and each one is going to pinpoint one little thing. Partial marks for that won't work. OK? So um, sorry. Is it emergency? I'm in class. Is this emer uh, emergency? OK. Sorry. I have to take these calls. I have somebody in hospital. I have to see if it's an emergency or OK. And I, they don't fathom the concept of this is the time that I'm teaching. Don't call me. OK. <laughs> They keep calling me. Anyways, um, um, yeah. So uh, as I was saying, uh, mm, uh, what I was saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walkthroughs are few, small ones, and I cannot give partial marks to them. Obviously, when I'm marking your um, programming question, when I'm looking at your walkthrough, if I see it's very close, I'll do something. But it's not a promise. OK, it's not a guarantee. It's not a promise. If I can do it for everyone, I will. Um, I, I have always done that. But I always tell you there is no partial marks, but I give it anyway. So that's what I'm saying. So assume that there are no partial marks. So don't come to me and tell me, OK, um, I, I put just an extra x over here. Can I get like half a mark? Don't ask that. If I have time, if I give it to everyone, I'll do it. Or no one. It's all, either everyone or no one. It's not going to be one person yet. Um, questions? Uh, the workshop marks are up. Your feedbacks are coming. OK? Yes. You did. You did. I explicitly remember. I remember your name. I remember entering your name because it was the last one. You should have it. If you don't, it's really strange. You don't have it? No, no. Up to workshop four. I didn't mark anything after. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. I'll, if it's not open, I'll open it up and I'll set everything for it. So uh, you don't have your grade? How is it possible? Oh, this this Blackboard thing is driving me nuts. Seriously, I'm. Uh, um, I have to go check. Maybe it's not automatically posted. I have to. Let me pause the recording because I'm really surprised now. Yeah. So um, the the rows of the class are like this. So I have to stand over there and teach this. Okay, and you'll see why. Okay, so. Let's say I'm over here now, all right? And I have different types of balls over here. I have a, a volleyball, I have a basketball, and I have a soccer ball, OK? So I have three different balls over here, OK? And I'm asking the first row, now remember this, please. The first row over here is going to, I'm going to throw these balls. And I'm going to ask the first row over here to catch the soccer balls. And I'm going to ask the second row over there to catch the volleyballs. And I'm going to ask the third row over there to catch any type of ball that is coming through. Actually, let's do it the other way. I'm going to make the first row to catch any type of ball, second row soccer ball, third row volleyball. OK? Are we OK with this? If I throw a soccer ball, who's going to catch it? 
first row. If I throw a volleyball, who's going to catch it? First row. So it's not going to pass because I ordered it incorrectly. So I'm going to do it the other way. Soccer ball, volleyball, any ball at the end. And at the end, they're going to receive anything that shapes like a sphere. Okay? So now if I throw a volleyball, who's going to catch it? Second row. If I throw a soccer ball, who's going to catch it? First row. If I throw a basketball, who's going to catch it? Third row. If I throw a globe of earth, who's going to catch it? Last row. Correct? Does everybody understand this concept? This is exception handling. What I told you is exception handling. Exception handling works exactly like that, which means you have series of lines of code that is written, and each line of code might throw a ball. Those balls are called exceptions. And then at the end of the line of all the code, you write catch statements, literally. Catch this exception, catch that exception, and these exceptions could be unrelated, like I'm going to throw a brick, or I'm going to throw a ball, or I'm going to throw a baseball bat, okay? Completely un unrelated. If that's the case, then each person is going to pick up anything. And I cannot put anything at the end because these have not, has no relations. So if I throw something that is not one of these things, everybody's going to get confused and it's going to hit the wall. That is called an unhandled exception. Okay? But a proper type of exception handling is that all these things are related, and the one that is at the end is mother of all exceptions. And when you come forward, it's going to become more uh, narrowed down as we go through. I'm going to write the syntax of exception in C++ for you with unrelated types first, and then after we went through, so I want you to un understand the concept of exceptions, and then after we are done with this, I'm going to actually uh, show you how proper exception is designed, okay, when we went through all different types of functions. I wanted you to know and understand what exception looks like. So exception is written in uh, uh, something like this. So let's first write a main thingy over here. <coughs> so what you do, uh, let's say I, I have uh, three. I'm going to have over here an integer i, uh, double uh, d, and I'm going to set it to, say, 10. And I have a character string over here, and I'm going to set it to... Uh, a C string. Okay, so I have three things over here. Then I'm going to write a loop. And so I'm going to write over here four. Uh, say I set to zero, I less than uh, three, and I plus plus. And I'm going to run something three times. So, what is the syntax of exception? An exception has two different types of blocks and one, com one statement. Two blocks, one statement. The blocks are called try and catch, OK? The statement is called throw, exactly what I did. So first, I created my scopes, if you noticed. I was over there standing trying to throw balls, correct? So the action of throw was there, where I was trying. Each section was catching. It's exactly the same thing. So in your code, what you do, you try throwing, throwing something, and then you catch it as you go through. And this catch can be many of them. Catch, 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 catch. And one of them is going to catch what you try to throw from there. And if none of them catches, then your program actually terminates, is terminated by. So this catch keeps going. Believe it or not, your own uh, program is being tried by operating system. When an unhandled exception comes from your executable and the operating systems, nobody caught this, it terminates your program and gives you a message, unhandled exception was thrown. Okay? So what do I do in here? I'm just going to write a few pieces of code. So I'm going to say if 
i is set is i is zero. Okay, I'm gonna throw the d object. Then if i is set to if i is one, I'm gonna throw the SDR object. If none of them happens, I'm gonna throw throw the I itself. See out? This will never happen. If I didn't have a throw over here, there was a chance for this C out to happen. But when I have a throw before C out, and it's unconditional, when the execution comes over here, it throws the exception. Therefore, C out never happens. So the action of throw goes to a catch. It's kind of a go-to to a catch that matches that throw. So if I have over here a catch for a double, then I can then the double that is thrown over here will be thrown and catch sees it's a double, it catches it and puts it in the double exception. This is not an exception, it's a double object. Okay? <laughs> All right, so now in here I can say uh, a double exception was thrown, was here, or is here. And I'm going to show DE and go to new line. And in here, I'm going to say C out. In here, I'm going to, I'm going to receive a constant character pointer. And I'm going to call it C string exception. And I'm going to say C out. Uh, C string exception is here. And I'm going to sh uh, show the C string exception. OK? Now, if you don't want this catch thingy to get out, first of all, because these things have nothing to do with each other, it's an extremely awful type of extension to design. It's just showing you what the syntax is. The perfect exception is that the bottom of the exception is, is the mother, then the children and grandchildren, they come up. So you can actually adjust what is thrown, and it's going to pick up the proper one. And if, uh, because uh, you will see that we actually have an object of type exception that you can inherit from. And that's the general exception that we have, OK? So anything that you create should be instantiated from, should be inherited from that. Therefore, at the end, you can have a general exception caught and see what happened. But even if you don't know what the type of the exception is, you can catch anything that comes in. So you can say catch, three dots, and over here you can say uh, something went wrong. Something was thrown. I don't know what. So you don't want the unhandled exception to be gone to operating system. You want to catch it. Now, in here I could have caught the I and show you what it is, but I just wanted to show you something that is not a match how it's going to actually run. So, so this is just syntax. Nobody writes a code like this. It's just showing you how things are getting executed. So when I run the program, It comes in here. Obviously, i is 0. It throws the, as you see, everything over here will be skipped and not executed. And it jumps to where a double is caught. And it's going to say double exception. And then it goes to the end. All the other catches will be skipped. Now I come back over there here. I try again. This one, i is 1. 
So this now a constant character pointer is thrown. Therefore, that catch is going to be executed. And it goes over there. It's going to say C strings coming here. It goes up. Now I is 3. Neither of these happening. So this I is going to get thrown. And because I gets thrown, it goes to the one that catches everything and says, I don't know, something went wrong. So exceptions are happening like this. All right? So why they have done this? Why we have an exception thing created like this? The reason is that um, when they were actually doing all the programming and stuff that they have done, you know you have actually two major things when it comes a pro with a program that actually, um, it's just an example, that deals with a user. You have the business logic and you have the user interface, correct? They're two different things, right? So in, a, in an ideal world, let's say you connect a database as step one, then you do some kind of a calculation with what you got to the database. Then you ask the user something's going to happen. Then you do something back to the database. Then you close the database and you're done. So you have five steps that in an ideal world when everything goes right, that's the, the sequence of things that are supposed to happen. If you do it with normal way, that is not exception handling, then when you're opening the condition, you have to put an if statement after. If the extension was, if the database was successful, then else part goes to the business logic. Then if business logic goes well, fine. But if it doesn't, you have to write another if statement. In the else of that one, you have to ask the user the thing. If the user enters something proper, then you're going to do whatever. If not, then you have to have it. So it's going to be nested levels of if for everything to go well. Do we understand this? With an exception handling, you put all the things that are supposed to go perfectly back to back, and you do all the error handling in the catch statement. Catch statements that you have with an S, plural. Okay? So your business logic is not going to have some nested stuff that is very difficult to follow. You will see what is a perfect situation, and if any of those things go wrong, you go to the catch statement, you handle the error, and you go back up and try again. Yes. Oh, the, the, in here, the, nothing. I just gave you syntax for it to see how it works. I'm going to show you when we get to the, the exception part uh, to how actually uh, write an exception that makes sense. Yes. Yes, any type of exception that is thrown will be caught with this one. It means anything's coming, catch it. Of course, you don't have any handle to it because it doesn't know what is the object. Because uh, C++ now is strongly typed, you, know ex you need to know what is the type of something that is coming to catch it. You cannot put it in anything. No, there's <laughs> no, no. no. Actually, it's a good idea. I don't know. Maybe you can, but I don't think so. Because auto needs the value to get initialized too. This is not a function. This is a statement. I do not know how the catch is implemented. Is it working like a function? Which means this is not, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know if it's initialized or it's set. If it's initialized, it's possible. If it's set, it's not. If the double over here is set to what is coming in, then you cannot have auto. But if it's initialized, then you do. And when you have, um, I don't know, I'll try it. But that's a brilliant idea. I don't know. I really don't know. Can you just try by setting auto see No, double auto works. No, I mean, not, not, I mean, basically double auto see Then every, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pick up everything. But it can, would it pick up everything? Huh? Yeah, but even that one, you mean this auto becomes, uh, well, well, let's try it. I don't know. I really don't know. So you're saying put over here auto and see what happens? Yeah, the last one. No, if, if it works over here, no, it doesn't. <laughs> there you go. So no, if it works for the first one, it's going to work for the last one. It doesn't make sense. So, so the answer is doesn't. 
many companies, many organizations completely hate exceptions. They don't use it at all. I believe Mozilla was one of that. Yeah. Like when you did, when you worked on, on Firefox, uh, you, you didn't have except all functions return success. All actions return success or, or failure. It was designed that way, if I recall correctly. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that was the case. Yes? No. No. You have to have a proper design. C++ requires proper design. C++ is powerful, but you have to design. It's not like JavaScript. You just put a variable, whatever comes in, here, I'm just going to get it. Okay? It's not like that. You have to actually know. You have to plan for things, right? <laughs> And that, that's, what, that's what's made, that's all these little things that you have to take care of instead of the language makes the language faster. So language doesn't have to make all those decisions on the fly. Um, any other question? We're going to talk about exceptions in, in a few minutes. I just wanted you to kind of know what the syntax is so when I design it, you'll know what's going on. So when I show you the design, you know what's going on. Are we good? Oh, no, I said, if I recall correctly, I was in the pro in, involved with them 15 years ago. If I recall correctly, 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, but of course. It, it, you don't have to use exceptions. Like, for example, the new, when you do new, okay, you can actually include the header file that supports exception, instead of new returning null, it will throw an exception if memory is not, if memory is not occupied successfully. You can do a try catch. So you can say try new, like a is equal to new something, catch if memory was, so you can do it that way, but still if you don't include that one, you, then it works like old times, which, which returns null when it's not successful. So you can do both ways, okay? You have the, ex Again, C++ is like this for everything, when you think about it. If you are lazy enough, you can just write C in it, right? Well, the heck with all the standard template library and all the C++ 20 that we have. Let me just write a for loop and do my work. <laughs> so yeah, so something like that. OK, so just keep that in mind. So um, we OK with the syntax of exception? That's just syntax, again. And these catch and stuff can be 10 steps down. It doesn't have to be in here. That's why it makes it so bad. In, there is no, when, when you throw something, let's say this main is a function of its own. Okay? And it's called in another thing. And you have over here a throw that you did not catch. Then the other function is going to catch it, which means your function will have an unconditional exit into another function. So, Exception handling is cool, but you got to be careful not to overuse it. If you don't throw an exception, if you don't catch an exception, it's going to keep going into the calling functions. And you have to catch them in there. And because of that, two seconds, any function that you write that throws an uncaught, that throws an uncaught exception, you have to document it. So anybody calling your function must try it, not just call it and catch it. Otherwise, the program may crash if something goes wrong. So any program you are writing that throws an exception that is not caught, you have to document it. This function does this and this, and uh, throws a record not found exception. So anybody who wants to use your function or class or whatever it is, tries it and catches no record fun exception to make sure that the program won't crash. Okay? Yes. Yes. Um, it's separating business logic with error handling. You, you nest throws by nesting tries. Each try has a throw inside. Or if you don't have a try and you're only throwing, which means your function must exist in a try. Otherwise, the program won't compile. 
Oh, I have never seen one. Nested tries? That's ugly. No, no, no. No, no, no. I've, no. No, I, 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 like, I would throw up if I see one. Okay, so, yeah, so, because, because, nested, maybe, they, maybe, we used to have a professor that, like, I, I, I used to have a professor. I had a professor who used to say that if your logic grows more than one uh, screen, you have to put it in a function. <laughs> okay. Now just imagine you're saying nested exceptions. You know how long your code's supposed to be to have something like that. Usually it's better to separate that into different uh, packages of logic, I think. Are we good with exceptions? Are we okay one? Wilson, are we okay two? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So. So exception syntax, nobody writes a program like this. This is like, I may give you a walkthrough like this to see if you understand what the syntax is, but nobody writes a program like this. And exceptions for user interface. Let me tell you something about exception before we continue. Who knows what is the meaning of exception? Huh? You have to speak loud. No, exception is not an error. Except I'm talking English, not C++. This is exceptional. What does it mean? Not usual, correct? Something not usual. An exception is something that is exceptional. So you're writing a user interface, as I'm going to give you the example for it, is not a good example for an exception. It's not an exception for the user when, enter, when user enters something that is not correct. Users are stupid. Even when you are testing your own, your own program as a, as a user, you act stupid to see if your program is foolproof. We call it foolproof, right? So exceptions are not for that. Exceptions are really for things that are exceptional, that are not supposed to happen, but they happen. So use it as such. For error handling for a user interface, that's, that's not a place to have exceptions. I don't know. I would just have regular uh, try and error type of thing. Um, exceptions are for you are connecting to a database. You have the proper user ID. You have the proper uh, password. You have the proper, proper path. For the server, you have the proper address for a server, and it always worked, but today it's not working. That's an exception. And usually you stop that and you throw an exception, you log and you terminate the program. That's an exception. A record that must be in a database because you inserted it yesterday or your logic dictates. Uh, you guys have took database already? Okay, beautiful. So let's say you have a, 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 a table with a primary key in it. And then you have a dependent table with a foreign key to that primary key. Okay? So you insert the first row over there. And based on that, you insert the child row over here that has a foreign key to that parent key. Right? And when you insert it, the database tells you that the parent key doesn't exist. That is an exception because you entered the thing and now you are doing the other one. Logic dictates that it has to be there. If it's not there, that something's wrong. You have to really sit and think about it. That's an exception when you throw an exception. You follow what I'm saying? So exceptions are exceptional things that are not supposed to happen in usual circumstance. And that's not a user interface. In user interface, beep always happen. <laughs> it's not a... It's not uh, uh, an exception, OK? So let's go back to our review. So we, we understand how, what exceptions are. I'm just going to go back to a quick review on what we've talked about when we talked about mm, the, mm, functions. And we started with understanding what. So just uh, wake up, everyone. Now come back to what we had before. We talked about pointer to functions, and we said pointer to functions. Functions like every uh, package of data 
they, they sit in memory and they have an address and you can hold that address in some place and to actually create uh, a pointer to a function that holds the address of a function you, you literally write the prototype of a function um, and then you put the name of the prototype inside parentheses and put an asterisk beside it. That makes the name of that prototype a pointer to a function that can hold the address. For example, in here, I have add the receives, receives integer A and integer B. I write the prototype for that one and then I write over here func ptr. So func ptr becomes an address for that uh, function. And if I set it to the name of that function, therefore the address of the function will go to func ptr and I can call the func ptr using the pointer. Hence, I can pass the logic from one place to another. What was the purpose of having func pointer to functions? Is when you want the logic to be passed as data and you want to have different logics pass to your uh, uh, program, okay? So these are to your functions or whatever you have. And you want your, log your, your, uh, your logic work differently based on different patterns of logic. And therefore, you pass the address of the functions to them. Uh, we said in C, if you want to call a function using pointer to a function, you have to put the asterisk beside it and put it in parentheses, but in C++, that becomes the function itself. You don't need to put those stuff over there. Are we okay with this? That was the thing. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's C and C++. Pointer to functions is not a C++ feature. It's a C feature. We've done it in C forever, right? Day one of C, we had pointed to functions. We had that. C is like that. C deals with everything as address of, like it's a very low level language, right? Um, I asked it because like, why do we need like, addresses? Why don't we get the value C? Or can we do like all the addresses? That was the syntax in C. I have no idea. I have to look at the parser, OK? It's the same thing like a structure. When you create a structure, you have to put struct something, something. Why do you need to put the struct when it's a right? OK. <clears throat> and they keep, uh, I don't know if it's improvement or changing, they keep improving the syntax of the language as we go through. Right now, like at the beginning, we have two ampersands as and, right? Yeah. Now you can write A and D, oh. right? We that we had or two bars that freaked them. Oh my God! That means or. It says oh now okay write O R so you're happy. All right, so you can do that. Okay, so they are trying to make it. They're adding stuff to that. Anyways, <clears throat> then we talked about how this makes it possible to have a series of logics serialized in a, in a, in, a, in an array. So we created a, an array of pointers pointer to functions, and we set them to four different functions, write it in a loop, same function call ru runs different logics. So first it runs this, second that, but all these things are conditional to the fact that these uh, uh, have the same signature, otherwise we can't have a pointer to function. For them. We okay with the second one too, right? So the next thing, <clears throat> templates. How do we deal with templates when we have pointer to functions? It does not make any difference. When you have a pointer to a function and you want to use templates for them, you simply pass the pointer to function, but instead of signature of the function, you put the template type. 
So if I have uh, functions that I want to change, for example, ascending and descending, depending how I want to sort an array and I want different logics to be passed to it. If it's ascending, it has to be A greater than B. If it's descending, it's supposed to be A less than B, right? If that's the case, I want to pass different ones, different types of functions to this. I can have a template that compares the two. So I simply say this has to support greater than sign, this has to support less than sign. So the functions are created, and because the functions are created that way, the prototype of the function over here, which dictates what is the pointer to the function, will, gener will be generated the same way. Therefore, this can accept the address of that one. And therefore, in my code, when I want to sort an array of integers, I'm going to say I have seven integers, I want to be ascending, and I'm going to specialize the function with int to tell to the compiler I want the int version of this function passed to it, and so on and so forth. Because sort is an integer, this is going to be an integer, and it's a match, it's going to sort. Be good? So that was when we talked about template. Yes? Elaborate. I didn't understand the question. You said uh, you don't know how we can define a template in a. Like, like they're, in, they're in the same scope, like line 7 and line 12, they're in the same scope, right? Yes. So defining a template T. Oh, okay. So, so, so. A template only affects the scope that comes after. Therefore, the type ends at line 6. Because of that fact, this T has nothing to do with that type. You follow what happened? So in here, when I say template T, it only affects the scope that comes after, which is the sort. Therefore, this T has nothing to do with the T that comes after. Does that explain? Yeah. Okay, all right. Any other question? Yes. Uh, I, um, um, uh, uh, again, I beg you to please speak out loud, like opera voice. Oh, la, 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 la. Talk like, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Do you mean if I have two types passed yeah, to it, put comma, type name, put the second one? Um, I don't know how can I apply it to sort because it doesn't apply, but what you're saying, what, how can I have two? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. It, your logic dictates that you need two different things to change for this one. For example, I have... Uh, uh, I have a collection, I have a dictionary, and I have the key to change, to, to, to search for. And each dictionary, actually that comes with the dictionary. Uh, if you have two different types, it's... Yeah, so if that's, that, that doesn't work here, but, but, uh, Say, 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 if I want to do something like this. So type name, T1, type name, T2. Let's say I want to write uh, type name, oh, what was that? Let me just think for a good example for a second. Let's say I want to find, so I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to write uh, auto 
uh, find max, type name, uh, oh sorry, T1, A, T2, B, and I want it to be T1, the maximum of the two. What do I mean by that is that if I want to find the maximum between an integer and a double, I want the return type to be of type integer. So when I find max, I want the, the first argument to be the type that is returned. Is that okay with this? So now I can write a code like, um, I'm going to write it long, not short, so it's easier to, I'm going to write some stupid code in here. So this is not the most efficient code. I just want to use these things. That's what I'm saying. So I'm going to say a T, uh, T1, uh, uh, arg2 is set to T1 of B. So I casted the second one to first one and put it in arg2, right? Now I'm going to say over here, return uh, uh, A greater than arg2, then return A, otherwise return arg2. So this template dictates if I do a find max with two different types, just a second, two different types, the maximum of the values will always have the type of the left argument. Does that answer the question? Yes. <laughs> Let me come close. Let me come close. I'm just here T, 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 and T, 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 and T. Okay, go. I want I want the return type to be in the in the in the signature. That's why I put it at right. It doesn't have to be, but the, it's gonna be. You don't have to specialize it so when I you're. Like T1. Pardon me. Yeah, you can. Okay. But uh, get used to this. That especially when it comes to lambdas, you have to do this. There is no other way. Okay, you can. If you want a specific type of return type, we'll come to it soon. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to comment this because that was your question. What is your name, sir? Dog? Dog? Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> you see how I hear, right? I think I'm losing my hearing. I heard dog for, for, for Jonathan. <laughs> okay. So, Jonathan, that's, I commented it because that has nothing to do with sort. That's your answer. Remember that. Okay? No problem. Okay. Yeah. So that's that. Uh, save. So this is going to be uh, the uh, funk PTR uh, template. Review. I have to uh, uh, to tell you that, that that I love this class. This is a class that is really challenging, and people actually ask questions. It's really good. Thank you. Um, I just uh, I can't I, I won't pass through things even for review so, so so easily. People ask questions. That's very nice. Yes. Yes, later. Yeah. You can actually ask the compiler what is the type. The compiler is going to tell you. That's one of the reasons we use auto. Anyways, we'll come to it. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was functors. So we went, we, we talked about functors, and functors are essentially classes with the function call operator overloaded in them. Okay, 
function call operators overloaded in them, and that's what they are. These type of functions, these type of things can be, uh, these type of uh, classes uh, can be used as functions. So, and when you instantiate them, you use the name of the, when you instantiate them, you use the name of the object and the function call operator to, to, to deal with it like a function. So the add thingy that I exam give examples for it at all time, I'll create a class add, and I overload the call operator with left argument and left, right argument and right, literally an add function inside with operator function call overload in it. Okay, therefore when I instantiate add, whatever that's gonna be, if I, uh, therefore when I instantiate add, whatever that's gonna be, I can use, a, use the object as a function. That's why it's a function object, okay? That's why it's a function object. And so the, uh, it, it has nothing special about it. <laughs> no problem. I don't use it. Go. <laughs> oh, I have to actually have two. <laughs> so don't bring it back. I have three, actually. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. <clears throat> so um, why we did that? To be able to pass around logic without pointer to functions. We've already had that mechanism that we could encapsulate stuff inside a function, inside a, inside a class. Now, using this, we can literally create the, 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 the action that we want inside a, a, an object and just pass the object to whatever we want. So we don't have to deal with the pointer to function and all the good stuff that we have. You just pass a reference of an object, and that becomes your function. Okay? And for example, uh, the line thingy, the good thing about creating functors is that now you can actually give state to your function, which line uh, gives, is a, it gives a perfect example for it. So I'm saying, first of all, where I'm printing the, the, uh, the line, I pass an O stream reference and I uh, initialize it to C out, but I always can change it to whatever I want. So I can put it in a file if I want to. So I can have a divider in a file if I want to, depending on what I uh, initialize the O stream to, that's what's going to happen. You know that this has precedence to that one, right? So what happens is that in, if I just create the line like that, it creates the fill at start and yada, yada, yada. And I can always create setters to set the start to whatever, set the, uh, uh, the fill to whatever I want. So we could actually do that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so yeah, so this is a very simple example for a for a line functor, and I'm going to have a line divider with dash and another line divided with uh, uh, assignment that is writing something in a file called line.txt. And when I run this program, uh, the divider 50 is going to show the divider on a screen. But if I go, what is he on? Anyways, file divider is actually does divider in that thing. I, I wrote it sometimes. Some, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's that. So this 70 is going to uh, put it in line.txt, and the other one's going to put it. So um, any questions about functors? All right. I'm going to put this up. So what I did, I create series, created series of integers, integer objects. And I used all different types of functions in them for validation and stuff. We'll come to it in a second. Okay, and when I'll, I'm going to utilize all these in those one by one, so uh, so that's the functor. Pardon me, A B C D E, right? Correct. Thank you. So, pause. So, <clears throat> a lambda expression is a brief way. A lambda expression is a brief way to create an anonymous function. 
anonymous function. We could create temporary nameless objects, right? We can create temporary nameless objects by uh, literally put the name of the constructor and put something, if a nameless object gets created and gets vanished after we're done. Well, we cannot create temporary nameless functions. And sometimes we do need them. That function that I have written for functors, is it here still? Yeah, like ascending and descending. Why do I need to create two one-liner functions? If I could just pass an anonymous function to this instead, a small little, little thingy function, and just put it in here, nameless function, inside this argument, create it in here, put the logic in here, everything from here to here, then I didn't need to uh, create those things over there, and it would be much, much simpler. Okay? So they were introduced in uh, C11. After C11, we started having uh, uh, lambda expressions, and they are used like crazy now, uh, especially in the STL algorithms, standard template library algorithms. Any place that you uh, can accept callable objects. What is a callable object? What is a callable object? What is a callable object? It's an object that has oper uh, function call operator implemented for it. That's a callable object. So if a callable object is when I write foo a, then I can put a in parentheses in front of it as if it's a function and call it. That's a callable object. Are we okay with this? Okay. So, the general, let me just copy this and put it right over here. I put it like this so we kind of can see exactly what the syntax is and then do it. Now we don't need to say. So that's the syntax of a lambda. Yes. A callable object is a class that has operator function call overloaded in it. Operator parentheses. Functor. Functor. OK. Now, so the, the, a lambda expression by nature is a functor. It is just a function object. That's it. So. It has a capture clause, so essentially, literally, it starts with square brackets. Inside that capture clause, so let me just do it over here so you see what I mean. Oh. It has a capture clause, you see that? Okay, um, maybe I should put this right over there so you can see. Um, yeah, let me just explain. So it has a capture clause. It has a parameter list like any other function. It has a return type that you put over there, and we use it using the new thing that we have, the the way that we have, so you actually we identify what it, because you cannot, you cannot put anything at the back, okay? It starts from here. There is no return type. One of the reasons we have the new syntax for the function is the lambda expression. So we can actually identify what it returns, and then we have the body of the function, okay? So the capture clause over here specifies exactly how the outside variable, the, because this is essentially a, uh, and uh, an anonymous uh, function created within a scope, you need to tell to the compiler how does this thing deal with the variables outside of a scope. 
So, the, so inside the lambda expression, how can you access an integer that is outside? In the outer scope of this one, how do you deal with those things, OK? So that's where you're going to mention exactly what it is, OK? So the parameter is just like a regular function. Return type is optional. So if you put a return type, you're dictating what the return type it's going to be. So if you make a return type a double, and you return an integer, it will be casted to a double at return time, like any other function. OK? But if you don't put the return type, automatically it will have the type of the return it is returning. Got it? So yeah. Again, this is one of the, those people who love to re have three return statements in a function. Don't. OK? Don't. I mentioned in 244, and I saw it in your program. You're still doing it. A function must have one point of entry, one point of exit. OK? Especially in a lambda, if you have two return types with two different types, you're in trouble. OK? So always one point of entry, one point. There is no need to have two return types in a function. That is always resolved with an if statement. OK? So remember. And the body is the body of the thing. So the capture clause. In the capture clause, what do we write? If you don't put anything, it means nothing is captured from the outer scope of the lambda expression. So if you don't put anything in here, it means it's just something that has its own stuff, and it won't interact with outside stuff. Nothing's going to go back and forth. We we'll don't have anything in there. If you put an equal over there, it means it will have access to all the values outside, but it cannot change them back. If it accesses any of those values, the values come in by value, not reference. It, it literally as if it's re receiving those, those things by value. If you change the value, nothing changes outside. OK? If you put an ampersand, that means it captures all the values by reference, which means if you have a value outside, if you have a variable outside, inside your lambda, you change it, the value changes outside of the function. Essentially, when you put an ampersand talking in C, the outside values of the lambda expression become global variables for this. You have direct read-write ads again. If you put assignment, you have read-only access to values outside. If you have an ampersand, you have read-write access to values outside of the lambda expression. If you specifically want to mention which variable is supposed to be by reference, which variable is supposed to be by, by value, you write it like this. So I'm writing x, comma, ampersand, y. It means x is accessed by value, but y is accessed by reference. Yes? For the parameters, do you have to make sure if you specify in the capture like x and y, do you have to make sure that the parameters? That capture has nothing to do with the parameter list. Zilch, no relation whatsoever. Capture clause has everything to do with the variables outside of the lambda. Actual variables outside of the lambda, that's where you put the stuff in. OK? So if you have a variable name A, it would have to specify that this variable called A that's outside of By reference, then you put ampersand A. It means that person is going to be coming in by reference. And if you want, if you, uh, but you can bring this things over here, but it's extremely confusing. Like you can put an assignment over here. It means everything by value, and then say ampersand y. But y only is by thing. You can do stuff like that, but don't. OK? Don't combine these with, it becomes very confusing. OK? Parameter list is like just any other function. Return type optional, as I mentioned, and body contains. So again, in here, I'm saying auto add. So auto add is nothing. So this is nothing. I can actually do this.
I can actually do this. Uh, So this has nothing to do with the function. That's the reference handle you want to put the function in. Now in here, I'm saying int a int b and return a plus b, which means this is my anonymous function, and I am calling it. Does that make sense? That's why it's an anonymous. So instead of that sort thingy, I could have just put something like this and the two values for the sort with the template thingy that I had and returned whatever I wanted. So I didn't need to have an ascending or descending over there. I could literally pass the function to it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a lambda expression. OK? So these two are identical. If I call this, I'm using the handle add. Obviously, I have to put auto over here because you don't know what is the type. OK? And then you, if you want it to be integer, if I didn't put integer, it would be perfectly OK. It would work perfectly OK because the sum of a plus b is an integer, therefore it would have been an integer. So in here, having that integer is really optional. But this would work perfectly. Are we good? About the syntax of lambda? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. We'll come to it. I have a big one. We'll bring it down. So we're good with this down to this point? Yes. One more time? Uh-huh. No, no, so let's do it like this. It's a completely different function now. That returns a multiplication. So this is, this is just standing by itself. I could have, as I mentioned, this is nothing. It's just the handle for this one at the moment. I created something absolutely new in here that has nothing to do with that. Uh, let's actually change it just to make sure that we understand exactly what I'm talking about. In here, I'm going to go. So it's a completely new thing. The whole idea of Lambda is to create something anonymous, some anonymous action that you want to make. You can make this a big function, but don't. OK, I see people write ginormous functions as lambda. If that's the case, create a functor. Don't create a lambda. Lambda is supposed to be something that you want to just pass it just to see. You know, you have something small little logic you want to do. OK, don't do ginormous stuff, humongous stuff. OK, so. <clears throat> Uh, so, oh. let me demonstrate something from uh, that is kind of kind of a. Uh, 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 a, a kind of look into future. Let me do that. Remember sort we wrote? <clears throat> so in, this is lambda syntax. So I'm going to take these out. <clears throat> we don't need it. So I'm going to include. So <clears throat> vector is what we use whenever we want to use an array. We're going to see it the next, next week, OK? It's, it's an incoming thing, the SDL library and vectors and containers. 
<clears throat> so you can you can literally create a vector that looks exactly like a function like this. So I can actually create a vector of integers like this. It's an array of integers, the smart one. A good array of integers, OK? Now <clears throat> I can say, I can say, I can say sort. And this sort is an algorithm. It's, I, it's not a function that I have written. It's an algorithm, OK? I'm going to say v.begin. It means from the beginning of v, go right to the end of v, OK? And what do I want to do? I want to sort it ascending. So I'll, I'll pass the logic for sorting to it. So I'm going to say it's a lambda expression, integer a, integer b, OK? And in here, I'm going to say return a greater than b. Oh. So this is where lambdas come handy, OK? And then I'm going to say for int n in v, I'm going to say uh, c out uh, n and a space, and go to new line. Oh. So this is how C++ program, C++ programming uh, become. Uh, I, I always tell to my students, remember the phrase that we had, like old times when Apple, I'm talking about probably you were a kid at the time, you didn't know. When Apple came out, there was this thing that they had, you want this, there is an app for it. Whatever, you want to do that, there's an app for it. You want to, so they had this thing that anything you want, there's an app for it. In C++, you want to do that, there is a standard template library for it. Anything you want to do. Problem, yes. Yes, write a functor, function pointer. All of those works. And you can, pa you can have this thing in a function point, function, pass the address of the function to it. So exact same signature, two integers returning true or false, create a fun function to a pointer, or create a functor. All of them will work, yes. Yes, 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 yes. We'll come to it soon. This is next week's thing. OK, go ahead. Are you talking about how the vector works? Uh, yeah. No, next week, next week, please, next week. Next week, let's not talk about it. I have a, a, a plenty of things to go through. So yeah, so that's that. So we run this, it's going to sort it and print it in a sorted order. We OK with this? And it's just magic. So sort is done in algorithm, vector is in vector. And I'm saying this is the beginning of the vector, this is the end of the vector. So it knows where is the beginning and where is the end. And this is the function to sort it with. Sort, do it for me. And it does the most efficient sort ever for you. You don't need to think, oh, is it bubble sort, quick sort? No, it does the be best. You cannot write something that runs faster than that. You can even tell to the sort that do it using Palera processing. So you can even do that, OK? So these things are all in standard Templar library, OK? So. EFG, uh, look into future with Lambda. And now, um, I think Irish asked to, uh, did you ask to, to show the capture thingy? Was it, oh yeah, so. <sighs> So as you see now, I have an integer that accepts things with reference, and I have an integer, uh, and I have a show A that accepts things for, with reference. And this one is accepting stuff by value. Um, so I'm, one by one, I'm going to go through it so you see what happens. So <clears throat> when I call show, Show A, 
it shows the value of A. What is A? It's here, correct? So it accesses that, but let me just. So it accesses that value, and there you go. I have 10 printed. Okay? Now I'm going to say add to A, and I'm going to add 10 to A over here. So whatever is passed to add to that one is by reference. Therefore, when I do that, afterwards, A becomes 20. So it actually did it by reference. Then I come over here. I'm going to say get the value of A, all right, and show a line. So this essentially what it does, it shows series of lines that is 20. But it accesses the value of A without planning to change it. And if I show the value of A, it remains the same. Seriously? It, it, lambdas are so confusing that even C doesn't know how to, how to uh, indent it. So let me just, darn it. I, I, it was a very nice uh, organized code, and, but I put it over here, it just screwed it up. Let me see if I can, if I control Z it. Yes, thank you. Whew. Okay, there you go. So that's better. It, it, it auto formatted it and screwed it up for me. Anyway, so, um, so the other one, I'm doing it by reference, and as you see, I'm adding to the value of i that is outside, so i is 5 over here, and when I do that, when it's going to recompile and do it, but don't worry, it's going to be okay. So as you see, i is printed as 5, but when I do like this, i becomes 10, and a is still 20, because I had it as reference over here when I used i, the value of i was changed as it went through. Because now this is using I as an outsider. This one is shadowing the I outside. Now, I, this is something, so I want I by reference, but I want A not to be changed. So I do it like that. Now when I run it, as you see in here, I is changed, but A remains the same. And now in here, I'm saying I want everything by reference, but A by value, the thing that I told you not to do, OK? And it's exactly the same thing. As you see, it's not going to, OK? And, and that's that. And in here, I'm having everything by value, but I by, for, by reference. Therefore, I's value will change, and A will not. Hopefully, that was a good demonstration for that thing. So go through it later on, and you'll find out well, how things work. All right. So that was lambda, uh, the capture, all the capture thingies that we need to know about lambda. Uh, let me stop it. Yes. So Yes. Like how? Uh, auto to what? So create an auto and say probably yes. You're talking about these? That's standard syntax for lambda. Nothing. It's just an anonymous one. Yeah. This one, I give it a handle. That one, I'm not giving a handle. That's the choice you have. You cannot have a function without a name. You can have a lambda without a name. In here, I have the logic. It doesn't have a name. This is what I want to do now, and I don't want to do anything else. That's how I do it. Okay, that's the difference between lambda and a function. A function or functor must always have a handle. A lambda can be anonymous. You can pass it as an argument or something. Okay, <clears throat> so that's that. Now let's get it, get ready for this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So in this, probably it's going to fall on your shoulder. Um, um, I'm just going to give you all the examples that I have written, and I want you to go play with it. Yes, you have a question. Pardon me? 
Ah, uh, forget it. Don't have time. I, wrote, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to do that, but now I don't have time. I'd rather, I rather finish the thing than torture the students who don't come to class. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was I? I was here. Today's lecture. Oy, 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 oy. Copy. OK, that's going to take a little while. And I'm going to go to today's. <clears throat> so uh, I have written series of integer implementations. <clears throat> As you see, it's called int1. Int2, pointer to functions. Int3, functor. So it essentially is implementing the same thing. <clears throat> oh, what did I do with the, oh, the these are? Oh. Did I add the, yeah, so. Add existing project. So this one is uh, functor. No, it's correct. I think it's fine. It's the name of the project, so in there. I put it in a separate directory, that's why. So I went to Lambda. Because these all follow the same scenario, you will actually see what's happening in here. <clears throat> so in first one, what I created is an integer that <clears throat> has a value, and it uh, has a, a string, and has validation in it, and based on that validation does something. And that validation is something constant. I can't do anything about it. When I look at the, when I look at the, uh, the integer over here, you see that the validation is this, and I'm stuck with it. <clears throat> right? Validation says the value should be between 0 and 100. And I can't do anything. So the integer class that I have written, because the validation logic is a member function, it's doomed to always set to certain thing. Now I can put this one as <clears throat> minimum and maximum to do something like that. But that will be only minimum and maximum. I cannot check an integer to see if it's a proper social insurance number. The logic remains the same. That's OP244, old C++, C++ thingy that we have done. But then we found out that we can actually have a pointer to function. So instead of actually have the validation set, I can create a validation pointer to a function that receives a value, validates it, sets a, an error message, and returns a Boolean, and initially is null. So what do I do in my... <clears throat> I can not only set that in a constructor, but also while the program is running, I can set the validation and change the validation to what I want, and each time do different validations with it. So the logic that is coming with it is completely different each time. So as you see over here, the validation that I have in my main, when I'm in main, I have a valid age over there, a valid mark over here. The signatures are identical. All I need to do is to pass the address to my integer, and the validation changes. You follow? And the rest of it, you have to go. See, 35 people are standing outside. The next one, I have demonstrated how to do the exact same thing with the functor. And the next one, I did it exactly how to do it with lambda. After that, I did it with lambda and captures. And after that, I did the exact same logic with exception handling. 
please go through it. You know everything that you need to do for your test. It's not going to be that uh, crazy. But please go through the logic of these and come with questions the lecture day that you're coming, Monday. Are we expected to, be, uh, are we expected to know lambdas for the lambda? Yes. Go through, the, go through the weekly schedule. Anything that you see week 1 to 5, that's going to be on the test. Anything week 1 to 5, that's going to be on the test. Have a beautiful day. Thank you.